fascism, author Jonah Goldberg looks at the politics of the left and compares it to fascism. The event from the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. is an hour. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at the Heritage Foundation. I'm John Hilbolt, Director of Lectures and Seminars, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium, to welcome, of course, those who join us on each occasion at our Heritage.org website and those that will be soon joining us at a future occasion on C-SPAN Book TV. Uh, we remind everyone in-house to please check that cell phones have been turned off. Uh, we would ask that they actually be off, not on vibrate, because vibration even sometimes will distort sound. Hosting our program this morning is Matthew Spaulding. Dr. Spaulding is director of our B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies. His expertise includes American political history, constitutionalism, religious liberty, and civic renewal. Most recently, he served as the executive editor of our recent publication, The Heritage Guide to the Constitution. For those unfamiliar with it, it is a first of its kind clause by clause analysis of our governing document. He also serves as an adjunct fellow with the Claremont Institute and is author of A Sacred Union of Citizens, George Washington's Farewell Address, and the American Character. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Spaulding. Matt. Thank you. Good afternoon. On, on picking up this book, one probably does a double take. Uh, perhaps it's the warm smiley face on the cover, the one with the little Nazi mustache. But it's actually the title, Liberal Fascism, A Secret History of the American Left, From Mussolini to the Politics of Meaning. Now, we all love secret histories, don't we? But liberal fascism, isn't that a contradiction in terms? Haven't we all been told over and over again by the media and the academy that it's not liberals but conservatives that are the fascists? As a conservative, I've often been accused of it. It's a way to suggest that our views are actually beyond the pale, hateful, prejudiced, evocative of a dark past. But as it turns out, the accusation is not quite correct. Indeed, the story, it seems, is actually quite different. And indeed, as our speaker today turns the history on its head. Now that there's a con connection between modern liberalism and German political ideas is not new. Leo Strauss made the connection in the 50s, popularized in Alan Broom's blockbuster, The Closing of the American Mind. Recent scholarship has focused on American progressivism its love of the state and its origins in German universities. But what does all that mean for today, for politics? As is usually the case, quite wonderfully in this case, I would say, it takes a clever mind and a very gifted writer to put it all together. Along with new scholarship and analysis of his own, and a compelling narrative that gives us the full picture. And Jonah Goldberg has done that in this intellectual history. He is one of the most prominent young journalists writing about politics and culture in America today. He is a contributing editor to National Review, the founding editor of National Review Online. He is currently a member of the Board of Contributors to USA Today and is a weekly columnist for the Los Angeles Times. And his syndicated column appears regularly in the Chicago Tribune, New York Post, and, quite literally, technical term here, a whole slew of other newspapers all around the country. If there's anything right now that we need, at a time when political parties and political movements are rethinking where they stand and where they are going, it is a good, sound rethinking of the history of modern liberalism. Ah, but what is the secret history? What does it mean? for our politics. The best answer, by the book. Uh, but as an enticement today, we can listen to the author, 
our friend Jonah Goldberg. Join me in welcoming him. Thank you. If I knew that Heritage was going to splurge on a podium, I wouldn't have worn pants. Um, I want to thank Matthew. I want to thank uh, uh, Jim Weidman. Uh, I want to thank the Heritage Foundation. This is the first real talk I've given about the book since the book has come out, um, except muttering to myself in my basement. Um, and uh, so I'm going to try it out on you guys. And I'm very much interested in the feedback to see, see whether I'm doing it the right way. As, as Matt suggested, you know, if you're even a remotely typical conservative, you've been called a fascist, a Nazi, a stormtrooper, a brown shirt, plenty of times. And if you haven't, you're atypical, but you've certainly had your heroes and your role models called a fascist, a Nazi, a brown shirt, plenty of times. And this is quite in vogue these days, as we all know. We have this whole Bush-Hitler thing going around. Feminist author Naomi Wolf has a book out where she quite literally and seriously believes that the United States ex is right now um, exactly parallel to where Germany was somewhere in the mid-1930s. Uh, you have Joe Connison came out, uh, I would say he wrote, but it was really more like he typed, um, a book called It Can Happen Here, which basically said we were on the precipice of fascism. And uh, Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times author Christopher Hedges uh, sort of got his thesis right out in front and just simply called his book about the Christian right American fascists. Um, Today's F-bombers, people who throw the, the new F-bomb, fascism, around, they'll tell you that the reason they're doing this is because of George Bush's war on terror. Um, they'll say that, you know, what Janine Garofalo calls the 43rd Reich requires that they speak truth to power. And the argument, which we don't have to go into any great details, um, because it's not very detailed itself, uh, is pretty easy to summarize. Nazis crack down on civil liberties. George Bush is cracking down on civil liberties. Nazis use terror, and allegedly so does George W. Bush. Nazis invaded countries, so did the Bush administration. Uh, Hitler lied, Bush lied. Nazis rounded up Jews and called them enemies of the state. Bush is rounding up Muslims and calling them enemies of the state. Auschwitz, Guantanamo, you know, what's in a name? Uh, but aside from the bone-snapping stupidity of these charges, uh, the Naomi, Naomi Wolfs of 1930s Germany didn't go on multi-state book tours denouncing uh, Adolf Hitler, and there really was no Jewish equivalent of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. Um, there's one more reason to be skeptical. This is nothing new. Uh, in 2000, before 9-11, uh, when Bush was still promising a humble foreign policy, uh, Gerald Nadler had found the uh, whiff of fascism fascism in the Florida recount. During the Florida recount, Jesse Jackson uh, noted that, uh, that victim, Jewish victims of the Holocaust, then living in Florida, were being victimized again. Uh, Harry Belafonte says that, you know, dismisses Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell working in the Bush administration by noting that, well, Jews worked up, there were a lot of Jews in the higher levels of the, of the Nazi regime as well. For the record, that's idiotic. Um, Bill Clinton denounced the Texas GOP plat platform as a fascist tract. Uh, during, the fight, during the fight over the contract with America, uh, Representative Charlie Rangel complained that, quote, Hitler wasn't even thinking about doing these things, which is technically true. <laughs> Hitler wasn't thinking about sort of zero-based budgeting or term-limiting committee chairs or anything like that. Um, when Newt Gingrich invited <coughs> various black congressmen uh, to Republican cocktail parties as part of an effort to reach out to the other side of the aisle, uh, Representative Major Owens responded to Newt Gingrich by declaring, these people are practicing genocide with a smile. They're worse than Hitler. We're going to have cocktail party genocide. Uh, Ronald Reagan was, of course, called a fascist from the first days. He was fighting communists. Uh, before that, everyone simply knew that Barry Goldwater was a Nazi or Nazi sympathizer. My favorite example of that was when Daniel Shore, that sort of dinosaur-like figure you can still hear on NPR, when he was on CBS uh, as a reporter, he reported as fact that Barry Goldwater was heading uh, to Germany for vacation, so, so as, right before the Republican convention, so as to quote-unquote link up 
with neo-Nazi and various right-wing groups. So as to time their two campaigns, uh, um, uh, sort of suggesting that that Goldwater was um, when he visited when he was supposed to visit the Hitler's stomping grounds, as as Daniel Shore put it, it was sort of to emotionally recharge for the coming GOP campaign and race. Uh, every single fact, including except for, I guess, Daniel Shore's name, was false about that report. He didn't go to Germany, he didn't go to Europe, he didn't meet up with any Nazis, any of it. But it didn't matter because everyone knew that it must be true because conservatives are Nazis. Two generations of Hollywood scriptwriters have been warning about the fascist peril lurking to our right. Uh, in just recent years, we've seen Pleasantville, Falling Down, American Beauty, American History X, and countless other films that advance this idea in one way or the other. My favorite was when they adapted Tom Clancy's Sum of All Fears for the big screen. And you might think that there would be a certain verite relevance to the war on terror um, that they might want to capture in a book that talks about Islamist extremists uh, trying to snuggle a nuclear weapon and attacking the United States. But for Hollywood, this seemed too implausible or too scary or too mean or whatever the argument was. So they fell back on what they knew. And instead of Islamo-fascists trying to attack the United States of America, it was, of course, a cabal of conservative businessmen who happened to be a secret society of neo-Nazis. It seems that even after 9-11, the American left can't get over the idea that the existential threat remains on the, fasc the fascist right. Well, why? I don't have to tell most of the people at the Heritage Foundation that most of us conservatives don't spend our time whiling around, uh, you know, perusing Mein Kampf. Um, at least you guys don't. I had to for work. Um, my lips are tired. But uh, uh, I get called a Nazi all of the time. And I used to at least have fun with it. Uh, you know, when some kid on a college campus would call me it, or I get, you know, th I get this email where they think that if you call someone a Nazi, but you type it in all caps, it has to be irrefutable. Um, but so when college kids would call me a Nazi, one of my favorite things to ask them is, you know, well, except for the murder, bigotry, and genocide, what is it exactly you don't like about Nazism? And, you know, they look at me the way my Basset Hound used to look at me when I tried to feed it a grape. You know, they just <laughs> couldn't comprehend what I was asking. So I try to fill it in for them. The Nazis were socialists. The Nazi ideologist Gregor Strasser put it pretty succinctly. He said, we are socialists. We are enemies, deadly enemies of today's capitalist system with its exploitation of the economically weak, its unfair wage system, its immoral way of judging the worth of human beings in terms of their wealth and money. The speech that first attracted Adolf Hitler to Nazism when he was still in the army and he was investigating these various left-wing groups was a speech uh, entitled, By What Means Shall We Destroy Capitalism? The Nazi Party platform demanded, and I'll just read a few of these things, guaranteed jobs, quote, the abolition of incomes unearned by work, the nationalization of all large corporations and trusts, profit sharing in all, in all major industries, expanded old age insurance, government takeover of big business stores, think Walmart, and I'm actually pretty serious. There was a very much an anti-department store movement in the United States in Germany at the time for the same reasons we have anti-Walmart movement today, the prohibition of child labor and countless other progressive reforms. Then I might explain to these kids that the Nazis, all in the name of progress, sought to purge the authority of the state, I mean, sought to purge the authority of the church and tradition from society and to replace it with the supremacy of the state. The dictates, they also tried to impose the dictates of a new political correctness of a fundamentally pagan faith. In Mein Kampf, Hitler denounces Christianity as a spiritual terror that had smashed the, the much preferable pagan altars of the much freer ancient world. When some, Protestant visited, when some Protestant bishops visited the Fuhrer to register complaints, Hitler's rage got the better of him. Christianity will disappear from Germany just as it is done in Russia. The German race has existed without Christianity for thousands of years and will continue after Christianity has disappeared. When the bishops objected, and said that they actually supported Nazism's secular aims, um, just not its re new religious innovations, Hitler exploded, you are traitors to the Volk, enemies of the fatherland, and destroyers of Germany. In 1935, mandatory prayer in school was abolished, and in 1938, carols and nativity plays were banned entirely. By 1941, religious instruction for children 14 years and up had been abolished altogether, and Jacobinism reigned supreme. Uh, a typical Hitler youth song that they would, that they would sing uh, 
We are the happy Hitler youth. We have no need for Christian virtue. For Adolf Hitler is our intercessor and our redeemer. No priest, no evil one can keep us from feeling like Hitler's children. No Christ do we follow, but horsed vessel away from the incense and holy water pots. The Nazis partly grew, out, grew up out of a, of a green movement and a youth movement and a health movement, three of the movements that are so dominating today in our culture. Uh, the proto-Nazi philosopher and rabid anti-Semite uh, Ludwig Kleges wrote one of the founding texts of modern environmentalism. And in 1980, the German Greens reissued the text to celebrate the founding of the Green Party. The Nazi war on smoking would make Michael Bloomberg's heart leap. Nazis led the world in researching organic food and alternative medicines. Uh, the concentration camp Dachau had the world's largest uh, alternative and organic medicine research center. Uh, according to the medical historian Robert Proctor, the National Socialist campaign against tobacco and the whole grain bread operation, they're really big into whole grains, um, are in some sense as fascist as the yellow stars in the death camps. Nazism rejected open scientific inquiry in favor of research dictated by relativistic and holistic imperatives and was tainted with a mysticism that exalted the natural order above reason. A lot of the buzzwords that the contemporary postmodern left likes to bandy about were actually invented by Nazis or Nazi philosophers uh, like logocentrism and deconstructionism. Heinrich Himmler was an animal rights activist and promoter of natural healing. Hitler and his allies endlessly discussed the need to move the entire nation to vegetarianism as a response to the unhealthiness that was promoted by capitalism. And then there's Mussolini, a fantastic dancer. No, uh, then there was Mussolini. Mussolini uh, was raised on the mother's milk of revolutionary socialism. His dad read him pages of Das Kapital when he was a child. Benito is not an Italian name. Ben it's Benedetto is the Italian name. He was named after Benito Juarez, the revolutionary leader in Mexico who actually uh, overthrew Max Emperor Maximilian and killed him. Uh, he didn't learn the name Il Duce as a fascist. He learned the name Il Duce as the leader of the socialists in Italy. He was uh, deeply admired by both Trotsky and Lenin when he was still a socialist in good order. He was famous for his hatred of Christianity. At college courses, he liked to stand up in a room and dare um, God to strike him dead with a lightning bolt. And then when the lightning bolt didn't materialize, he would then go on a big jag about mocking Jesus and Christianity. Uh, when he was kicked out of the Socialist Party solely su for supporting World War I, we can get back to that if we need to, um, in order to save socialism in his words, he responded, whatever happens, you won't lose me. Twelve years of my life in the party ought to be sufficient guarantee that my so in my socialist faith, socialism is in my blood. Mussolini's fascism was dubbed right-wing by orthodox communists as a way to discredit dissent from the Bolshevik party. But, Mu but Mussolini and the Italian fascists remained committed to a populist, saturated socialism. We can get back to that, too. When the fascists were elected in their first election, here's what their program included. And I've got a whole bunch of it, so I'll try to read it fast. They wanted to lower the minimum voting wage to 18. Uh, they wanted to lower the minimum wage of a representative to 25 and give universal suffrage to women. Uh, they demanded the abolition of the Senate and the creation of a national technical council of an intellectual and manual labor industry, commerce, and culture. They wanted to end the draft, repeal titles of nobility. They wanted an eight-day workday, eight-hour eight eight workday, a minimum wage, worker particip participation in government, reform of the old age and pension system, expanding them gra greatly, and as well as various worker safety reforms, the expro ex expropriation of the land of the wealthy, the construction of secular public schools dedicated to educating the proletariat, a one-time expropriation of all riches, um, seems to me, all you need is one time, right? Um, the seizure of all goods belonging to religious congregations and the abolition of Episcopal revenues. The review of all military contracts and the quote-unquote sequestration of 85% of all war profits. The nationalization of all of the entire arms industry. So yes, those anti-elitist, stock market abolishing, child labor ending, public health promoting, wealth confiscating, draft ending, secularist right wingers. So when you point these things and myriad other facts out um, uh, to support that the conclusion that Nazism as well as Italian fascism were phenomena of the left, liberals fall back on this other argument. They immediately switch to this sort of, uh, sort of cudgel of the Holocaust to shame you into pointing anything, any of these things out. They say, what are you doing? You're pointing out that the 
The Nazis were socialists. You think that's what's important about Nazism? The Holocaust was this terrible, evil, horrible crime, the worst crime in human memory. And I agree with that in, almost entirely. It was certainly the signature evil of, of modernity. And, you know, I mean, I can certainly understand why maybe an Armenian who was slaughtered might think there are other ones, but it is certainly a defensible position to say that the Holocaust was the signature evil of, of modern times and, and the most horrific crime we can imagine. And then they'll say, oh, but, you know, the Nazis were warmongers and all this kind of stuff. So what they're saying, in effect, is that the reason why it's okay to call conservatives fascists and Nazis is because in the important ways, we're like them. You know, I mean, socialist stuff is irrelevant. What's really important is, you know, Nazis were genocidal murderers, and, well, you know, nudge and a wink, so are American conservatives. It, it, it really doesn't hold up, and in fact, it's slander, and, uh, and it's something that we need to stand up against. Uh, now, the problem with this is that when I start making this argument to this sort of patchouli stoked hemptivist on a college campus with open-toed shoes and closed mind, uh, by the time I get to my denouement for all of this, he's gone off to Taco Bell to get a gordita, you know, <laughs> preferably a vegetarian one. Harry Anderson used to have this great shtick. He was the guy from Night Court, and he started out as Cheers, and he was sort of a con man, magician, comedian. And he used to do this thing where he would say, and he was a juggler, big juggler, and he would say, you see this axe? This is George Washington's original axe. Now, unfortunately, several years ago, the handle broke. So I had to replace that. And then last week, the blade broke. So I had to replace that. But in essence, this is George Washington's axe. And that's sort of what's happened with the word fascist. Is the left has, and it's kind of ironic because the fascist, the symbol of the fascist, which was always a left-wing syndicalist revolutionary symbol in Europe um, when Mussolini picked it up, uh, the symbol of the fascist is an axe too. And, I could probably extend that metaphor somewhere, but I don't know where I would go to. But regardless, it is an amazing thing. Think about it. Socialism. More people have been murdered, slaughtered in the name of socialism than have been murdered or slaughtered in the name of fascism or national socialism um, by orders of magnitude. The Black Book of Soviet Communism says that in the name of socialism, 94 million people were wiped out. China killed 65 million people in the name of socialism. And yet, Socialism still has this sort of touchy-feely, namby-pamby, wouldn't it be a great world if it worked kind of feel to it. You know, it's not a slander to call somebody a socialist. It, it, you know, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. We were the only conservative people there. We were sort of like Christians in ancient Rome. You know, you had to draw a little C in the dirt by the playground and then wipe it out to see if there was another conservative run. And I know lots of people who call themselves socialists. I know lots of people proud to call themselves socialists. And if I say, how can you call yourself a socialist? You people are worse than the Nazis, at least as measured by the number of people you killed. Uh, they say, what are you talking about? That's crazy. Socialism isn't about killing people. Fascism is about killing people. And never mind that those numbers are actually low because they don't include the people the National Socialists killed. And this gets us to what is what Tom Wolfe calls the greatest hoax of the 20th century. And I know he says this because he says it right there. Um, how did fascism come out to mean the opposite of communism? Uh, there are a lot of reasons, and I go into it at considerable length in the book, but the two most important ones are Marxist prophecy and Marxist propaganda. The prophecy is pretty easy to summarize. In all of the um, copious you know, uh, essentially religious scripture of Marxism, there is this prophecy that at the end times, when uh, capital, the internal contradictions of capitalism can no longer face the immovable forces, unstoppable forces, cold and personal forces of history that are going to bring the proletariat up to the happy wonderland at the end of history, capitalism will have its last gasp. This was Trotsky wrote this all the time, you know, that the last gas of capitalism where the forces of privilege and nobility and capitalism will fight back against socialism and try to beat back the inevitable tide. So there were some sincere and honest Marxists who said, aha, that's what fascism is. The prophecies are true. And this was very happy for them. And, and you've got to remember, and I go into this quite a bit, um, as someone who subscribes to the views of Eric Vergelin that all of these movements were essentially religious in nature, um, 
George Sorrell, the very influential uh, uh, sort of, he's the linchpin between Leninism and, and fascism. He was a huge influence to both Mussolini and, uh, and to Lenin. And, and Sorrell himself was hugely influenced by William James. Uh, what basically happened was that Sorrell combined William James's will to believe with Nietzsche's will to power, and that's how you get fascism and Leninism. But regardless, so a lot of people said, you know, that there was this, oh, so anyway, so Sorrell came up with this idea with the noble lie, which is basically this thing that you tell the masses to make, give them motivation. His biggest, most famous one is the general strike, that if we all just lay down our tools and stop working, then we would own the means of production and everybody would be happy and cats and dogs would sleep happily together and all the rest. Um, but another one was that he argued that we basically, that it became already obvious by the turn of the century in the 20th century that, uh, that, Marxist prophecy, that Marxist as a political science, as a scientific socialism, made no sense and wasn't working out. And so what he did instead is say, let's treat it like a religion. Let's tell the masses that it's basically prophecy, that it's basically this me millennial messianic faith, and we'll get them to believe that way, and at least that way we'll make some progress. So that was what the prophecy was. And the beautiful thing about it is that so many people believe the prophecy so that when Stalin actually came out with the propaganda, um, the two went together very well. They meshed. And that brings us to the propaganda. The basic reason why National Socialists are fascists, according to Stalin, was that in the great competition, the great Coke versus Pepsi, ideological structural struggle of the first half of the 20th century, National Socialism was just a heck of a lot more popular than International Socialism. The, inter the fundamental idea behind International Socialism, you know, workers of the world unite, is this premise that a factory worker in Irkutsk was supposed to have as much fellow feeling and love and solidarity for a factory worker in Munich or in Cleveland or in Timbuktu. And that turned out to be unworkable. And Mussolini has lots of writings where he explains why. It just doesn't turn out that way. It turns out that people come from a culture. They want to talk to, they know people who speak a certain language. They know people who have a certain shared experiences. And the idea that a factory worker in Milan was going to have more fellow feeling for a factory worker in Moscow rather than say his manager whose kid plays soccer with his kid and who happens to be his brother-in-law was just ludicrous. And so it turned out that people wanted to belong to a nation, but they also wanted to be socialists. And they did survey after survey. This guy Theodore Abel, a really pioneering social scientist, did these surveys of the old fighters of, of, of Nazi Germany, the guys who came before the revolution. And they say over and over again, they're just transcripts of it, you know, of these essays where they say over and over again, I really liked communism. I really like international socialism. But I don't want to follow what Moscow says I have to follow. I want to, I want to be for Germans. And it's, got to, it's, it's vital to remember, you know, we talk in this country, we've, in, we've in inherited these Marxist categories and ways of understanding where we somehow believe that nationalism and socialism are at opposite ends of some ideological spectrum. And this is just idiotic. When we nationalize an industry, what are we doing? We're socializing it. When we're socializing an industry, what are we doing? We're nationalizing it. Hugo Chavez, you could search in Nexus for all these things about what he's doing to industry, and half of them will say he's socializing industry, and half of them will say he's nationalizing industry. These are distinctions without a difference. And the people in Germany and the people in Italy recognize this, and they wanted to be proud nationalists and socialists. And Stalin realized he was having his lunch eaten. And so what they did was they declared in 1928, and then subsequently at other internationals, that henceforth any progressive or socialist group that wasn't loyal to Moscow, that wasn't playing for their team, could no longer ever be called socialists. They had to be called fascists. And they used you know, this, this prophecy thing about saying, aha, see, these are your enemies. These are the other guys. And this is the other team. And so they're the opposite of us. But as we know in real life, um, the worst hatreds aren't between people who are the most far apart. It's between the people who are the closest. It's part of this, you know, kumbaya nonsense that you get, that if we all just increased our understanding that we would all get along. Well, I can tell you right now that, you know, Palestinians and Israelis understand each other really, really well. 
Irish and British people understand each other, or Irish and English people understand each other really, really well. Pakistanis and Indians understand each other. Turks and Greeks understand each other. Turks and Guatemalans have no clue about each other. No wars. You know, it's an amazing how that works. <laughs> and so the essence of, of the hatred between communism and, you know, uh, I should say Bolshevism and National Socialism, the essence of that hatred was born of the fact that they were competing for the same people. And there's reams of social science that backs this up. In Germany, you have communists, and you, you have communists constantly switching sides and moving over and become red shirts becoming brown shirts. It is a fight to see who is going to control the left in Germany, not the right. But what we get confused by is that since the communists had so many useful idiots in the West who were willing to follow their party line come the 1930s, that what was called at the time right-wing socialism, the socialism just sort of drifts away, and all we're left with is right-wing. And we start importing these European concepts into the Anglo-American political discourse. The simple fact is, is that, you know, you, I don't know, most of you guys probably had this in college where you had your political science professor. He goes to the board and he says, you know, something like, you know, I'm not, an, uh, I'm not a fascist or a communist. And besides, you know, uh, extreme ideologies, you know, they meet. And he draws a circle, and, you know, you go all this way and you end up this way. And oh, isn't that clever? And we get some of this stuff from Hannah Arendt. And we get some of it from Arthur Schlesinger. And we can talk about that if you like. But we should just sort of say right now, it is bizarre and idiotic. Um, nowhere else in life do we say that something is so tall, it's short, that something is so fat, it's thin, that something is so big, it's small. We do say that, you know, some puppies are so ugly, they're cute, but, okay, exception that proves the rule. The, the point is that fascism is not the opposite end of the political spectrum from, from socialism. It's that Bolshevism and fascism or national socialism are two variants of socialism. Richard Pipes has argued this for a very long time, that that fascism and Bolshevism were both heresies of socialism. And the best proof of this is probably the fact that in the United States of America, prior to this propaganda slash prophecy, you know, explosion in the early 1930s, the American left had very nice things to say about fascism. It didn't occur to the progressives of the 1920s to say, oh, they're opposites. They saw them as linked phenomena. Lincoln Steffens, you know, the famous guy who goes to the Soviet Union, he says, I've seen the future and it works. The year before, he went to Italy and said that, Mussolini, that, that God had formed Italy out of Mussolini's rib and that this was the experiment that was going to show how decadent parliamentary democracy and classical liberalism was the dying and desiccated corpse of the, of the 19th century. Ida Tarbell, you know, the famous muckraker who brought down Standard Oil, the State Department didn't want her to go to Italy because they thought she was going to cause too much trouble. When she gets there, it turns out she just had a full-blown crush on Mussolini and comes back and says, you know, he's the cat's meow. It is the exact same phenomenon we see today with Hugo Chavez. It's the exact same thing. These are the Sean Penns of, of the 1920s who go off and they, ah, the future, it works. You know, let's beat up rich people and take their stuff. Brilliant. Um, Charles Beard, the legendary economic historian, you know, the economic interpretation of the Constitution, which I had to read, I don't know, 47 times in college. Uh, he writes in the New Republic, which was, well, we'll get to more in the New Republic. Uh, he writes in the New Republic about Mussolini's Italy. Beyond question, it's an amazing experiment being made here, an experiment in reconciling individualism and socialism, politics and technology. It would be a mistake to allow feelings aroused by contemplating the harsh deeds and extravagant assertions that have accompanied the fascist process, as with all other historical forces, to obscure the potentialities and the lessons of the adventure, no, not adventure, but destiny, riding without a saddle and bridle across the historic peninsula that bridges the world of antiquity to our modern world. This is like Ezra Klein writing about Barack Obama. Um, <laughs> Herbert Crowley, the author of the uh, uh, Promise of American Life, the foundational text of modern, you know, modern progressivism, now modern liberalism, the founder of the New Republic, was objectively pro-Mussolini, defending him against all detractors in the New Republic, comparing him to Abraham Lincoln, who also had to crack a few skulls for the right reasons. The promise of American life, it's like uh, the Tocqueville's uh, Democracy in America. So many people claim to have read that thing, and they're all liars. I am astounded. You read that thing, 
And it is, it is amazing what a fascistic guy Herbert Crowley is. He's for uh, wars to, you know, he's, he's, he's for wars to create a moral tonic at home. He's for a secular saint who's going to impose order. He's against sort of mere democracy. He's contemptuous of classical liberalism. He thinks violence is worthwhile. He's for founding national myths and nationalism. Um, he's for national socialism. He explicitly says so. You go down the list of almost all the an anatomical checklists of what a fascist regime is, and almost every single one of them can be found in Herbert Crowley's Promise of the American Life. And it's funny, when you read historians, they're very cautious about this. There are all these phrases where people say, well, some people say Herbert Crowley might be a fascist, but, and they never really explain what the but is. They just sort of say, we know that's not true. Because it can't be true. You can't admit that it's true. All right, in the 1920s, when they looked at, it's absolutely true. You know, and Amy Schles has this wonderful book, The Forgotten Man, about FDR, and I highly recommend it. And it is absolutely true what the conservatives and what National Review has been saying, what Heritage Foundation and conservatives have been saying for 50 years, that, uh, that the liberals of the 1930s looked to the Soviet Union for inspiration. Absolutely true. Um, more true than they looked at fascism or, or national socialism. I mean, it, it is true that, say, W.E.B. Du Bois goes to Nazi Germany as late as 1937 and says, all right, this makes sense to me. But we can leave that for another time. It is absolutely true that the Soviet Union was their first and foremost their goal. I mean, Jane Addams says that the Soviet Union is, uh, is John Dewey's philosophy applied 150 percent. I mean, they really fell in love with the place. But that doesn't mean that they thought that fascist Italy was at the other end of the spectrum. Lincoln Steffens refers to the, uh, uh, the Russian-Italian method. Believe that these, both these methods, that most of these things that were going on in Italy and, and Russia were basically examples of the same phenomena, the same wave of the future as, as Anne Murrow Lindbergh called it in her book. That the rising tide of the collectivism and experimentation, an idea that we get out of pragmatism, which was a sort of foundational philosophical uh, text for progressivism and for fascism in enormous ways. Uh, that in this age of experimentation, what they're doing in Italy, what they're doing in Russia, this is the future. And shame on us, the progressives said throughout the 1920s, that we let go of what we did here under Woodrow Wilson with his war socialism, when we cracked down on individual liberty, where we took over industry, where we unleashed propaganda. The world's first propaganda mystery, ministry is under Woodrow Wilson. Robert Nisbet has talked about how the first instance of true political totalitarianism in the 20th century was unleashed in the United States of America under Woodrow Wilson. If, if, if one scintilla of the charges against George Bush being a fascist dictator are true, then it is undeniable that Woodrow Wilson was a fascist dictator. Undeniable. And we can go into that if we like later. But I want to sort of sum up. In the 1930s, these same progressives who, who, who cut their teeth on Woodrow Wilson and his war socialism. They were out in the wilderness in the 1920s. They're looking to the Soviet Union. Stuart Chase, the guy credited for giving the name to the New Deal, wrote a book called The New Deal. Um, uh, he, he looks at Russia and says, why should the Russians have all the fun remaking the world? Uh, George Sewell, one of the editors in the New Republic, writes this book uh, where he argues, you know, we planned in war. The impl implication being that we can plan in peace. We have to get back to the war socialism that we left behind. Shame on us. We're no longer progressives in the sense that we're not at the cutting edge of progress. And so along comes the, the, the FDR administration. And it's funny, you know, when people have argued that the FDR administration had these fascist tendencies um, or was inspired by the Soviet Union, a lot of liberal historians will say, oh, you know, you know nothing, right-wingers. You know, you don't understand. It had its roots in the American tradition going back to the Wilson administration. The Wilson administration was 12 years earlier. I mean, this is essentially the same thing as saying, you know, the, the, the guys who took over the New Deal, the brain trusters, they were essentially, you know, they're like, remember Carter retreads in the Clinton administration? These were Wilson retreads. You know, they just all came back in and they wanted to recreate the exact same thing. The best example is Hugh Johnson, who was on the War Industries Board under Woodrow Wilson, who was, uh, and then ran the NRA, not the National Rifle Association, as I've disturbingly learned most college kids think. Um, even when we're talking about the, the New Deal. Uh, he ran the National Recovery Administration and uh, was a devoted Wilsonian. And the first thing he does when he gets his office is he hangs up a picture of Benito Mussolini on the wall. He starts handing out copies of the fascist tract, The Corporate State, gives one to, uh, to Perkins, who's the Secretary of Labor. 
uh, during the Democratic Convention, he distributes a memo where he says that we all have to sort of follow the, muscle, the, the Mussolini model. And he has this long sort of half tongue in cheek thing about, oh, maybe it would be a good idea if we shipped uh, the Supreme Court and Congress to a deserted island in exile for maybe 90 days so we really make some progress around here. Um, he launched enormous Nuremberg-style public rallies across the United States under the logo of the Blue Eagle, which was essentially the New Deal swastika, um, and, and argued that anybody who didn't comport with the New Deal, with the New Deal codes, was essentially a traitor. And he was not considered some crazy right winger. He was considered a prototypical New Dealer. And there were other people who were influenced. It got so bad um, with uh, uh, fascist Italy applauding what FDR was doing. I mean, Mussolini writes a review of FDR's book, Looking Forward, on the front page of the fascist newspaper, and he says, hey, you know, this guy's one of us. Look at what he's doing. It's, it's exactly what we're doing. He's part of this new movement. The Nazi party paper um, did the exact same thing. Hitler said the exact same thing. And this was all considered still fairly normal, except out of the world, outside the world of sort of dedicated communists. And so I want to sort of sum up uh, by sort of telling you one quick anecdote. Anecdote: On a warm day in 1932, H.G. Wells visits Oxford University summer school to deliver a major address to the young liberals, who were basically the progressives of the day there. Um, and the intended purpose of his, his, his speech is to bring about a phoenix-like rebirth of liberalism. People forget now, but H.G. Wells was indisputably, if not, if not the, then certainly one of the top two or three intel liberal intellectuals um, in the English-speaking world in the first half of the 20th century. He was enormously influential on the social gospel movement in the United States. His, 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 his sermons and speeches were read from pulpits across America as sort of a theological inspiration for American progressivism. He met re repeatedly with FDR in the Oval Office, referring to FDR as the world brain, um, or the head of the world brain. Uh, his, his writings inspired you know, Upton Sinclair, Sinclair Lewis, all of these guys to no end. He was a leading member of the Fabian Socialists until he was kicked out, until he basically left because he was too radical. He was exhausted with what he called gas, waterboard, and school socialism. He wanted something more radical. And so he goes to Oxford and he says, we have to have this phoenix-like rebirth of liberalism, um, of progressivism. And he says he's been struggling all of his life to come up with a word for it, a phrase for it. He says, you know, he used to talk about in his books, he has these samurai, these overmen, these air marshals, these superhuman people who parachute in and fix things. There's all sorts of really creepy fascist stuff in H.G. Wells' things. He had wonderful things to say about, you know, men of action and, and the cult of the deed, as the Nazis like to say. Anyway, so, but he, could, he just couldn't come up with the right word for it. He's, but something to summarize his view of, about the role of will and the ideas of public-minded, masterful people. And he said that we needed a, a militant organization that could run things. And he runs through a speech and he says, finally, I have the idea that summarizes what I've been arguing for for my entire career. And the name he gave it was liberal fascism. He also called for enlightened Nazism. And my hope is that that won't have to be the name for my sequel. Thank you all very much. We have uh, a time for some questions, and we have two microphones. If you would raise your hand and, and wait for microphones so we can uh, hear you and be picked up on, on tape. Um, who would like to start? There's plenty here to, to ask about. Right here. Hi, my name is Nicole Morgret. Uh, I read uh, your book, and um, during the chapter on uh, Roosevelt, I think you briefly mentioned um, Hollywood's involvement in like with the Roosevelt administration to make uh, propaganda movies mm -hmm. and um, well the history of this I was reading in some other books is pretty interesting um, especially you know they're trying to make uh, Russia look good because we were allies uh, I think uh, Lauren Bacall was originally going to be cast as a uh, a Tartar woman soldier in a movie that didn't end up funny she doesn't made. look Tartar but anyway huh? It didn't end up getting made, but um, my, my question is, um, if you see that modern um, liberalism is kind of, at least has some philosophical 
connections to in in this American fascism. Um, uh, what what do you see like Hollywood's role and like propagandizing for that? Because like today, you know, um, Edwards has like Susan Sarandon or whatever on the campaign trail with him, and I know it's not the big studio system which would have fit into the fascist mold much better because, you know, it's this big uh, machine. But uh, I was wondering if you have any comments on that. Sure. Um, uh, one quick anecdote from the book. You know, uh, remember in late Clinton administration, there was this whole thing about how, uh, how outrageous it was that uh, there were some tax credits for networks for having um, anti-drug messages and, and programming. It was this big hullabaloo for a couple days. And I always think about that, and then you actually read about what happened under the Roosevelt administration. The best example is Gabriel over the White House, which I talk about in the book. In Gabriel over the White House, you have uh, the story of a Hoover-like president who has this epiphany. It's a lot like Dave, you know, has this epiphany and decides to go out and, and uh, execute mobsters um, and uh, corporate fat cats so that we can make progress in this country. And it's this really absurd thing, you know, with machine gunning down, you know, your enemies and kicking in doors and all that kind of stuff, and everyone's supposed to cheer. And uh, the funny thing about it is, is that it's such an ode to fascism and all these kinds of things, and one of the best script doctors for it was FDR himself. They sent him a copy of the script. He loved it. He made some changes. You know, he had some notes, as they say in Hollywood, and he made some changes and sent it back and sent a nice note saying, I can't tell you how useful this is for the cause. You know, and... Imagine George Bush, I mean, sending an email saying, could you have a favorable, you know, comment about me in your movie and watch, you know, the heads explode at Salon or something like that. I mean, it, it, just, it shows you how much times have changed. Uh, I think that the reason why uh, we see in today's contemporary Hollywood, we see a lot of the things that we saw in the 1930s from the movie stars um, themselves <coughs> and from a lot of the producers, because... You know, the Hollywood left are probably the perfect distillation of, of the, the utopian ethos in liberalism. I mean, you see it with Barack Obama, this idea that if, you know, by simply by voting for me, the personification of all of our ideals, the head of this organic movement, there's some fascist stuff in there, um, that we will lift ourselves out of the present and go to the sunny uplands of history, that, you know, society will be, he says, will achieve this kingdom of heaven on earth simply by, you know, voting for a guy like me. And uh, that's an emotional-based thing. You know, when you go to a liberal group, you know, they don't make arguments, they testify. I believe we should live in a world where, you know, this doesn't come at the cost of that, and that, you know, puppies and kittens should get along, and that kind of thing. And it's, it's a religious, emotional, psychological impulse. And I think what we see in Hollywood today is those same themes coming out again and again and again. The idea that if we just all really mean it and work together, we can, uh, we can get rid of the fallen nature of man. You know, movies, these end in a crescendo. They never show that, you know, two minutes later, the happy hero still has to go to the bathroom, still has to pay the rent. You know, it's just, and it's this emotional notion of how life works, and they transfer it onto politics. And they seem to think that the hard work are the rallies and the speeches and the election, and then once we have the right person in, we'll have a deliverer or a messiah or a savior. And um, I think that's why they have it in their heart to look to people like Castro, to look to people like Chavez, these secular deliverers, these redeemers who, can, who are men of action, who don't have to put up with those bad guys who happen to disagree with Hollywood. It's a very undemocratic ethos. I have a, a somewhat easier time understanding why young people are drawn to the utopian um, siren calls, but I have a really hard time understanding why people who have made their money in the market, like Warren Buffett, what they're getting out of this. What are they getting out of this? They, they can't be confused. They're too smart. Um, I think you should... It's funny, uh, Dusty Rhodes, the publisher of... Um or the president of National Review, he told me this story about, um, who's the governor of, of New Jersey? He used to be at Goldman Sachs? Corzine. He was on a trip to Egypt with Corzine to do some big public works, public-private partnership kind of thing to finance it. 
And on the plane ride back, Corzine says, you know, this is really how pretty much all economics, you know, in the West, this is how it should work. You know, the really smart guys from business at the very top and the very smart guys in the planning di divisions in government, they should get together and just do what they know they need to do. And, you know, I mean, it, the way we do things now, it's just so messy. It's so silly. And I think that is a, it's an understandable human impulse for these masters of the universe. These people who think they're smarter than everybody, they have the money to prove it as far as they're concerned that they're smarter than everybody, and they think they get fed up with the messiness of democracy, which was the argument, you know, for fascism in the first place. The argument for fascism was, you know, the phrase that they always used was that 19th century liberalism or 19th century liberal democracy was a putrefying corpse, and it was time to sort of get something fresh and new. And um, I think that there were, you know, and there were a lot of fascistic businessmen. I mean, uh, businessmen, there's this myth that drives me nuts about how uh, corporations are right wing. And as anybody who's toiled in the trenches of the culture war or conservatism generally, generally speaking, there are exceptions. The most unreliable partners in the culture war are big corporations. They're opportunists. They're not for free markets. They're only for free markets for their competition if they think they'll beat them. Otherwise, they are perfectly willing to suck on the government teeth. They're perfectly willing to violate all the principles of classical liberalism and free markets. They're opportunists. And uh, I think there are a lot of people who think that way in big business. And, and so I don't think it's necessarily utopian. It's just much more of a technocratic elitist strain, which was a big part of American progressivism and a big part of, of fascism and obviously of communism. Either one. Yeah. I'm Dino Drury. Uh, I'm Dino Drury. Uh, I ap appreciate your giving some context uh, to my ancestors, it, Italian immigrant ancestors, who were such great admirers of, of Mussolini and so outspoken about it that the U.S. government required them to register as alien enemies during World War II. Um, the question I would have for you is, first of all, what if, in fact, fascism and liberalism are very similar? Um, part of fascism, socialism, liberalism, all sort of part of the same substance. What is it that caused the break that led liberalism to side with capitalism and with libertarianism, limited government conservatism, and with traditionalism, such as the Catholic Church, um, and the Soviet Union against fascism. And is, and is your analysis, could your analysis be alternatively explained by the kinds of realignments such as those which have, and we like to think that it's going to stay this way, I'm not sure it will, that made conservatism the dominant political culture in the United States, in part by converting disaffected liberals into neoconservatives without their really losing their affection for big government. They just became big government conservatives. There's a lot in there. Yeah, there is. Um, My apologies. No, no, it's okay. I mean, the short answer for a lot of this is to say, how do you reconcile liberals' you know, support of this and of that is to go with the old standby. Liberals are often confused. Um, but at a, at a <coughs> more serious level, I think one of the points that sort of needs to, you know, sort of at front me needs to be made is sort of like what I was pointing out with socialism. You know, if I call you a socialist, I'm not saying you're like Pol Pot. Um, if I call you a fascist, I'm not necessarily saying you're like Adolf Hitler. It's important to remember that the Italian fascists were not bigoted um, anti-Semites or any of that kind of stuff. Mussolini um, denounced Nazism as racism. Uh, Jews were overrepresented in the Italian fascist party until 1938, from 1919 to 1938, when the Nazis essentially ordered them to th kick them out. Uh, the, uh, uh, not a single Jew of any nationality was uh, sent by the Italians anywhere under their control um, to the concentration camps 
until the Nazis actually invaded Italy in 1943 and took it over. The French lined up at the border with their Jews, you know, saying, come on, get them. Uh, the Italians actually had to prevent the French fascists from getting hold of, of uh, getting control, authority over their own Jews. Because the Italians knew that the second the French had authority over their own Jews in southern France, that they would be shipped off to the concentration camps. And so Mussolini fought it tooth and nail. Not so much because Mussolini was a good guy. Mussolini was often a putz, but, and he was a bad guy. But uh, the nature of the Italian people said, we're not going to be part of the Holocaust. They just did not want to be part of the Holocaust. They did not want to be murderers. And it says something decent and wonderful about the richness of Italian culture that you just they dragged their feet whenever they could and wanted no part of it. And there's some amazing stories about Italian heroism. You know, it's, Italy was the only country in Europe for a very long time to send its troops into har harm's way explicitly to save Jewish lives. You know, I mean, FDR understandably raced to, f to win the war, but he didn't do a lot to save Jewish lives. The Italian fascists did. Now, why do I bring this up? It's not to defend Italian fascism, but it's to point out that fascism, like nationalism, is inherently going to bring up the internal characteristics of a people. And uh, in Italy, it brought out Italian characteristics. In Germany, it brought out German characteristics. The German characteristics were a lot nastier. Um, and this is a big part of uh, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen's argument about the sort of Hitler's willing executioners. There was an exterminationist sort of anti-Semitism in, in the DNA of Germany that just didn't exist in Italy. There was anti-Semitism in Italy, but it was usually theological anti-Semitism. It was, you guys should be Christians. It wasn't, you guys are biological vermin that need to be destroyed. That's a very, sort of, I think, I haven't read up on it too much, unchristian point of view. And, uh, and so I think one of the things to understand in an American context is when I say there's liberal fascism, or when I say Woodrow Wilson was a fascist, or that we had this fascist moment from the turn of the century to the 1930s, I am not saying America turned into a Nazi-like country. The beautiful thing about the American people is that they are incapable of being turned into Nazis. It is in our DNA, American exceptionalism, rugged individualism, the, the, the tenets and precepts that inform the American founding simply make it impossible for us to embrace those ideas without an enormous, enormous antibody response, the kind of response we saw with people like Calvin Coolidge. And, you know, uh, I can't remember his name. Um, Waldo Frank, I think it is. He talks about this, you know, he says, if America goes towards fascism, it's going to be a friendly fascism, which is basically the last half of my book is about this friendly fascism. Because in the Anglo-American tradition, democracy and liberalism are tribal institutions. You know, we're not Democrats, small d Democrats. We're not small r Republicans. We're not, you know, classical liberals in America because the Constitution says we are. You know, if you burn the Constitution tomorrow, we would still be the same people. It is deeply rooted in our culture. And so the, the, the fascism or the, the genetic or the family resemblance, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that today's liberals are the sons of Hitler. They're, you know, it's more like they're the grand niece once removed kind of thing. You know, I mean, you see the family resemblances, but they're not the same thing, and they can't be, for we are not Germans. And um, so a lot of the contradictions that you might see in American liberalism with doctrinal stuff um, from fascism is a result of the fact that we're Americans, you know? And, and there's all sorts of these things. There's this effort to sort of make fascism into a thing and make ideas into things. And the reality is, is that, you know, all of these regimes that we called fascist, they're remarkably different, different regimes because they're different places. In, you know, in Germany, it was anti-Christian, but in Romania, it, they were Christian fascists. In Italy, in Spain, the supposedly, you know, first fascist, you know, regime under Franco, they, um, they rejected the fascist label, they, they protected all of their Jews, and they didn't fight in World War II. So, I mean, a lot of these contradictions have to do with the character of the people. Anyway, I couldn't answer it entirely, but that's stab. Yeah. Uh, were you waiting? Do you have a question? Oh, that's right. Yeah, last, I, I, we point. Oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> Philip Munoz, uh, Tufts University. Uh, your, your answer anticipated my question to some extent, which is what is the contemporary relevance that you're trying to draw out? I understand you're trying to show that the right is not fascist by showing the roots of fascism on the left. But then my question was, are you trying to show that the contemporary left, uh, Hillary Clinton, is actually a fascist? And was there a necessary connection between uh, modern uh, progressive thought and violence? And are you trying to make those types of claims? Okay, yeah, no, there's, there's a good question. Um, uh, 
this is one of the points I get a lot is, well, you know, fascism was militaristic, for example, you know, and I agree classical fascism was militaristic. Um, contemporary liberal fascism, what I call liberal fascism, is almost pacifistic. It's anti-militaristic. Um, and I concede that gladly and willingly. But I think people misunderstand the militaristic nature of Italian fascism or even of German fascism or of the progressives. Um, what appealed to progressives at the first half of the 20th century, and I use progressives broadly, um, was uh, the mobilization of the people that you got from militarism. Uh, William James's, I mean, I keep talking going back to pragmatism, but William James's essay, The Moral Equivalence of War, hugely influential um, on American progressivism and on Italian fascism. Mussolini often said that William James was one of the three most important philosophers in his life. He was probably exaggerating for American audiences, but it's hard to know. What is indisputably true is that William James was enormously influential on the theoretical founders of fascism, from George Sorrell to Giuseppe Prezzolini to, to Papini, all of these guys, these intellectuals around Mussolini of the early fascists and the futurists, were enmeshed in American pragmatism. And that moral equivalence of war argument, that you know, it brings out the finest spirit of the people and all of the rest, um, that was enormously persuasive. I mean, Mussolini declares the battles of the grains, the Amer civilian conservation corps, it's basically a paramilitary op operation. And uh, you know, John Dewey supports World War I because of the social benefits at war at home. Lots of progressive intellectuals were in favor of industrial armies. They thought that basically Americans should be drafted into the workforce and they work in a factory for 35 years and then they're discharged and can retire, but they'll have everything provided for them. This was a very serious model, first predicted by Edward Bellamy's uh, looking forward or Looking backward, yeah, right, because it's set in the year 2000. In the year 2000. Anyway, so there's a, um, the, it's not the militarism. I mean, it is, it is sort of a disgusting trope of the American left to see a uniform and yell fascist. West Point is not a fascist institution. American military defeated the ugliest forms of fascism. Uh, police officers defend civilization against barbarians. And to simply look at a uniform and yell fascist is moronic. But it is exactly this trope that the left has bought into time and time again. And it's a cudgel to shut people up and to sort of attack the regime generally. Um, and so you're right. One of the points of the book is this revisionist history to basically, not to put too unintellectual point on it, is to say, I know you are, but what am I? I mean, there is some of that, I will grant you. Because I'm sick of being called a fascist, you know. But, there's another point. Another one is to identify what fascism really is. If you can get past this liberal left psychological use of fascism as simply a stand-in for the word evil. You know, I mean, to go back to, if we can make it like the word socialist, simply mean something you may, may or may not disagree with, but uh, representing a certain orientation towards social organization, then you can start having a conversation about it. And I, I, I try to go into a great deal about how this religious underpinnings of these isms, how important all of that is. That's one of the points I wanted to elucidate in the book. But the last one is, if you are constantly looking that way for the fascist threat to come, you're focusing all your energy saying that guys in uniform are fascists, the guys in uniform are Nazis, that any attempt to defend you know, the social order um, from fo enemies foreign or domestic is inherently fascist then creeping up on cat's paws behind you are going to be the real fascists, and no one's going to pay attention. You're not going to have anybody sort of looking that way saying, you know, look at Hillary Clinton's It Takes a Village, which is replete. I mean, it was P.J. O'Rourke, not me. I think P.J. O'Rourke is the only other living conservative to have actually read that book. Um, it is amazing how all of these fascist themes come forth in there. You have to have business and government working hand in hand. It's this cult of unity. She has this, my favorite example in there is, you know, one of the, 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 the famous, you know, anatomical features of fascism that the left always likes to point to, and they're right, um, is the creation of false crises to mobilize society. I mean, that's the moral equivalent of war thing. That's why we had a war on poverty, for example. Um, and, uh, you have this desire to create crises because that will get people to drop their own objections to a social program and rally around the flag or rally around the government or rally around their leaders and all that kind of stuff. And then it takes a village, Hillary Clinton just flat out declares that every child anywhere born 
is immediately in crisis. Just boom, crisis. Government's got to step in. And, uh, and, and she goes into this, and she does it in this namby-pamby, marshmallow-soaked-in-honey kind of way that you don't see what she's talking about. But you know, one of the things, you know, in, in 1984, there's all this stuff, these jumbotrons saying, you know, work makes you free, or whatever they say. She has this passage in, in It Takes a Village where she says, you know, because these kids are in crisis, and because parents need the government, and because her definition of civil society are basically a bunch of bureaucrats, um, she thinks that, the, that civil society isn't the space between the individual and government. It's merely the arena in which government coordinates people, um, which is a fundamentally fascist conception. Um, uh, she says, you know, because these kids are in crisis, what we need, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had these television screens that we could put up, quote, wherever people gather, that would teach people how to breastfeed, teach mothers how to raise kids, teach men how to be good fathers. And I don't know, I mean, is it, is it so obvious if you're standing online line at the DMV and there's this jumbotron of, you know, an instructional video running on permanent loop 24 hours a day, seven days a week, telling you how to raise your kids? That that is just, it can't be fascist because fascists are bad people? I mean, it seems to me so quintessentially fascist. And set, we're not going to get the jackbooted thug stomping on a human face that you get in 1984, but we might get the brave new world, where the biggest problem there is how to deal with the fact that everybody is so happy. And we may, what we're going to get is a nanny kind of fascism, if we get one at all. And it's going to, but the point is, is that simply because the nanny state wants to hug you doesn't mean it's not tyrannical if you don't want to be hugged. Thank you very much. Jonah Goldberg is contributing editor for the National Review and a columnist for the Los Angeles Times. His work has appeared in several publications, including The New Yorker, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. For more information, visit Mr. Goldberg's blog at corner.nationalreview.com.